I'd like to start by saying a very warm welcome. Uh, and my name is Harry Lloyd Davis. I'm one of the partners here at Bevan and Buckland. Uh, and this is the first in a series of webinars that we are running, um, which is specifically aimed at the charity sector. Uh, so today we've decided to, to focus on and look at the, the area of fraud. Um, now that isn't a, uh, you know, that, that wasn't a coincidence we started with fraud. It's unfortunately a very topical issue at the moment, particularly cyber fraud. Uh, and so we're going to look at some of the major issues and um, what you as charity trustees and uh, managers or volunteers can do to reduce the risk of being a victim of fraud. Um, so I'm going to, I'm delighted to say that I'm joined today by uh, two experts. Uh, I've got um, Michael Jones and Damon Rands. So I'm going to start uh, with Damon. Uh, Damon, do you want to tell us a bit about yourself and, uh, and Pure Cyber? Yeah. Hi, Harry. Um, I'm, as you said, I'm Damon. My name is Damon Rands. I am the CEO and the founder of Pure Cyber. We are a cybersecurity company that is headquartered in the centre of Cardiff. In fact, we run all our operations from there. And we help businesses of all shapes and sizes um, combat cybercrime, really, and help them work securely and safely. Fantastic. Um, Mike, do you want to tell us a bit about uh, Bevan Buckland yourself and your experience? Yeah, I'm Michael Jones. I'm one of the partners here at Bevan Buckland. We're based in Swansea and we act for you know, pretty much all organizations, whether that's sort of not-for-profit and corporate organizations. We, from a charity sector, we do independent examinations and audit services, and we cover small charities ranging from sort of 20, 30,000 pounds of income, up to that with 60 million pounds of income. So we've got a broad experience across a variety of sizes of charity, and also charities that cover a variety of different services, whether it's actually providing hospital services or grants for other organizations. We've got a good rounded experience across the across the sector. Brilliant, thank you, Michael. But I thought I'd just start by being a bit of context as to why we felt fraud was something that was worth kicking off these series of webinars with. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the charity sector or, 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 you know, lost, it's in the billions of, of fraud um, a couple of years ago, but charities have lost 2.7 million alone just in intercepted fraud. But what always strikes me with fraud statistics is that the, 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 the figures that actually get reported are frighteningly low. So if that is what is reported, you can guarantee there is a lot more fraud going on out there in terms of, and that is just, as I say, money that was, was given effectively to fake charities and then, and then reported. Um, you know, probably other really frightening statistics. Um, this was a, a survey done by UK Fundraising. They, they surveyed 120 organizations and 43% were, were, victims to, were victims of fraud. Um, <clears throat> you can see from that graph there, between 22 and 23, the number of charities that were targeted was going up. So this is not a problem that's getting better generally. It is one, sadly, that is getting worse. Um, and the types of fraud that are most common, um, misappropriation of cash. So, you know, that's a posh word for, for theft by either staff or volunteers, fraud and the staff expenses and payment diversion, which we're going to come on to, which is one of the types of, of cyber fraud. Um, and I think probably one of the, the, the most potent reasons that we wanted to put this on is this is quite a startling statistic, which is in terms of those issues and where there were financial losses being suffered by the charity, we can see in 22, um, it's roughly two thirds probably didn't suffer a financial loss, often because we find that the banks actually compensate. This graph, which you can probably not see hugely clearly, but in 2023, far fewer charities actually um, having the banks pick up the tabs. And we've met with a couple of banks recently as a firm who you know, are, are honest with us that this is where they're losing more money than anywhere else. So banks are certainly becoming, it seems, more reluctant to compensate victims of fraud where they feel it is their own fault. So these are, you know, this is just sort of set, setting some of the, the scene to kick things off as to why fraud is such an important thing. And the point I want to make before we start is if you're sat there thinking, oh, fraud in charities or fraud in organizations is something I read about happening to other organizations, please, please do not think like that. As we saw earlier, almost half the charities in the UK have fallen victim of fraud in the last couple of years of some description. So you don't want it to be you that you're reading about or your charity the next time it's in the papers. Um, and hopefully we're going to cover some of the ways to prevent that over the next uh, 25 minutes or so. So um, I'm going to jump into a few questions. I'm going to start with you, Damon, if that's all right. Um, you know, we'll have a, a range of charity sizes on, on, on the call today, but are there any, um, what are the general advice from a cybersecurity perspective that you would say all charities should be following? Right. Okay, that's a, a broad starting question there. Okay, so um, 
Charities are an interesting sector, um, but very much like um, accountancy practices or law firms, they, they, they're they a rich sense source of data for cyber criminals, right? So that's quite often why they, they're they attractive and why they get targeted. So, and that depends on whether the, the charity is a five person charity or, you know, a, a thousand person charity. So that's a huge problem. Um, and also, I, I'm, always reminded of the stat from the National Cyber Security Centre that say um, 80%, they always say it, that 80% of companies have, have suffered a cyber event. Um, in fact, it's all of them because the others just don't realise that they've actually <laughs> had an event. So, uh, and, and an event can be ranged from anything, right, from clicking on a phishing email to having ransomware. So, um, what should companies do? Well, I mean, there is a core element to any organization, but charities equally as important, if not probably as more important, right, is most companies cannot answer the basic things. And what, what you should do with cybersecurity, cybersecurity, although it's an incredibly technical subject, and it is, and there's a lot of computer and technology all wrapped around it, but at its heart, it's a really basic simple process right a company needs to understand so a charity needs to understand what data do they have yeah. where is it and how do you use it if you can answer those three basic questions and let's be honest that's not a technical question for anybody to answer that's nobody understands their business more than the people who work in the business so for for someone technical that's a really difficult question to answer if they don't work in that company so that's the key thing that is by far the key thing right what data did you have where is it and how do you use it once you understand that then you can start to wrap appropriate controls around things so every company especially charities should start with that right should start with a piece of paper understanding you know what what applications do you use as an organization from that you can understand how you can protect your data a great example is i always use it so zero was an accountancy package yeah right? um loads of businesses of all shapes and sizes use zero zero doesn't back your data up you don't do it. And there is no option for you to back your data up. So that's your accountancy data. So understanding that, so you think, okay, so how would I recover from that as an organization um, if something was to happen? So it's very difficult to delete the data from it, but it's really easy to corrupt the data from it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then when you've got bad data, you've got a problem because all of a sudden it's not wicked. Or also as well, heaven forbid, but zero could go out of business. They could be hacked and they could have a problem and all of a sudden you're left as a business not knowing where anything is. So that's the, the main thing. You can add technology afterwards, right? But if you understand what you have, where is it and how do you use it, that is key. And that's that's that, that, that should be the, the sort of the kernel, the main piece of cybersecurity for any business of any size. Brilliant. No, that's great. Um, and, you know, what, what What sort of costs are you talking about? So, you know, we're going to have a range of different charities on this this course today or this this call. Um, some will be sort of large, well-funded charities, mm. which have got departments who can look after all of this. But you'll also have some relatively small charities with, you know, small budgets and potentially a tight funding environment ahead of us. Right. If, you know, if you were spending your money, where would you invest it to make sure you get your best value for money? Right. OK, so no, that's a fantastic question, actually. Right. So as a company, so we we provide fully outsourced cybersecurity services to organizations. So they do not need a cybersecurity department. They use us and we do absolutely everything for them. That's an incredibly cost effective effective way of doing that, yeah. right? And we're uh, the way we deliver our services is quite unique in that sense. Now, um, what companies need to do, though, right, is they there's a, a huge problem in the industry at the moment where companies, they they, they know they've got to do something. They, they If you ask most CEOs or of, of any organization, especially charities or anything, the, the biggest thing they fear is when they go to bed at night is they fear that they're going to get hacked, yeah. right? It's a nightmare, right? We, we all understand that. But quite often, they don't know where to do it. So this is where the problems really, really start for organizations. They quite often turn to their MSP, their IT provider. That's really, really the wrong person. So right? MSP there, is that... Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Managed services provider. Managed services provider. There we are. <laughs> in, in old money, IT provider. Okay. <laughs> right? And um, 
yeah and it's such a huge problem for organizations to, that you you can't do that because i've come up with a million analogies lately right trying to explain it it's like oil and water they don't mix right yeah the company that implements and maintains your it systems should not be the organization that monitor and test it right there is a complete there should be a complete separation of duties between organizations and unfortunately we've seen lots of organizations using cybersecurity as a selling tool so I was only talking to a company um, last week and they had two products that did, did exactly the same thing. They were paying thousands of pounds a month for both products because they had 5% different features at the ends kind of thing. And it was an absolute waste of money. And that was just bought through um, organizations just selling solutions to them. So if we go all the way back, understand what you have, then that makes it easier to um, choose the right thing pieces of the right solutions for an organization but cybersecurity should be expensive and in fact it should save you money in the long run because all of a sudden it helps you understand it helps you rationalize your data it helps you make the correct choices because uh i'll ask you harry right so there's a firewall available that costs 50 pounds there's a firewall that costs 250,000 pound and there's a whole myriad of solutions in between what's the right what's the right solution for you yeah, yeah. right and you don't know unless you know exactly what you're protecting so that's what cybersecurity helps you make those right decisions so it should save any organization money going forward it's a, so important and it can cost you know a so don't get me wrong, services can be expensive. And the more that you need because of the complexity, of, and quite often it is around complexity, yeah. the more complex your solution is and your systems are. But I, I think, increase. you know, the core message, and I think it's a fair one. Mm. I, I think, you know, we, we do audit work and most mm. of our clients will say to them, you know, we'll ask some questions about cybersecurity. We'll be referred back to their, as you say, their IT company. Yeah. The problem is if, if you know, they're marking their own homework. Yeah. So if you want to be safe, you need to get a second opinion and ask a separate yeah. IT firm or someone like yourselves to come in and say, right, what do you think of that setup? Does it look right? Exactly. If you want to be really brutal, um, if the IT company is doing the work and then testing themselves, what's to say they're yeah. doing a good job? And at the end of the day, there'll be very little recourse when a company has been, we were dealing with an organization, started first of March, they got hit with Lockbit, the, the ransomware. Yeah. And it, the, the whole thing has transpired that their IT provider missed a couple of things. It was between the IT provider and the client. They, they miscommunicated some things between each other, which just meant at the end of the day, though, that the company has lost all their data and now they're struggling to survive as an organization. If they had an external resource that was just dedicated to monitoring that and understanding that and explaining the problem, it would have been much easier. So, because, yeah. you know, if your IT provider is saying to you, oh, you need to upgrade that solution because, and it's going to cost you this much, Quite often, and quite right, it's why we don't do any IT. Someone might think, well, actually, you're just trying to sell me something then. Mm -hmm. And yeah. there's that, and you know, we we are, we understand that as business owners. But when there's when it's an organization like ours saying, look, you need to do this because you are vulnerable, we have no skin in the game. We're not trying to sell anything. No, that no. Any that sense. So sense. that's why it's really, really important. And, that, you know, that company uh, two weeks ago, they're, they're trying to pick up the pieces at the moment. In fact, they're waiting for their data to be put back on the dark web so they can get their information back. It's an absolute, not a not position right. that any organization wants to be in. No, I wanted to start with cyber security because mm -hmm. it is, you know, and, and it is probably the, as you say, it is the one that keeps us all awake mm -hmm. at night. Um, but Mike, I'd like to turn to you now and go back to probably the more traditional uh, types of fraud. So, you know, outside of uh, cybercrime, what are the other types of fraud that you, you know, we, you commonly come across or we see in the sector? Well, cyber is becoming a far bigger uh, issue of fraud. Cyber is typically your external threat. So, you know, somebody coming and sort of stealing your, your data, your money. So it's you know, perpetrated by your typical baddie that sort of people like us. So someone's sort of coming into the business. What we also see, which I think was on the earlier slide, was the misappropriation of funds. So that's where it's done internally. So that'll be, it'll be done by a, a finance manager, a finance director, it could be a trustee, where they're taking charity money for you know, their own benefit. You know? So what we'll see, it'll be old school, they'll be actually transferring money into their own bank account. You know, easy to spot if you know what you're looking for, but it's not complex. They are just making a bank transfer. 
go a little bit further, they'll be using a, a credit card. So they could be taking cash out. They could be buying personal goods on that credit card that the charity is then paying for. So very straightforward, easy ways of doing it. It then gets a bit more complex. You'll see people forging signatures. You'll see people mocking up copies of invoices for companies that don't exist with their bank details. Again, finding ways of trying to make a paper trail to sort of justify their means, but they'll end up with the cash. You know, and we've seen a number over the last of 12, 18 months where it, you're talking three, four hundred thousand pounds over a period of time has been has been taken. So it's not doing it for the odd one or two small transactions you know you're looking at on a grand scale and i think now with credit crunches or current climate there's probably more of an incentive if people are struggling you know if they've got that position of power there are opportunities there so it's lots internal and then the other side we're seeing far more probably in the last of six eight months is false uh association with charities so people will be going old school knocking doors or collecting money for a charity, but the money never gets to the charity. They're doing it for, for their own benefit. And then we've seen others for a small charity that we actually act for, someone else set up a GoFundMe page in their name, but it wasn't actually for them. They were selling unofficial goods for the name of the charity. Again, nothing was actually going back to the charity. So an opportunity for somebody outside trying to use the name of the charity to actually benefit themselves. And, you know, it's not an easy one to sort of to, to combat that. Is that just about vigilance? Is that just about keeping an eye? You know, is there, a, you know, Googling yourself occasionally to make sure there aren't any fake pages? Yeah. So internally, you said, the, you know, you can put sort of things in place. But externally, it is just being mindful of, you know, what's in the press. Has someone actually sort of fed back to you? I think the ones that we've seen have actually been in sort of press articles. But, yeah, you are reliant on somebody actually telling you, did you realise that you're somebody sort of collecting on your behalf? Whether you can sort of publicise on your website, we only collection via this method so you're actually notifying the public of these aren't genuine people because we only go down this route to making sure people are aware of it but yeah doing regular articles just to sort of make people aware of how you actually collect your your fundraising all you can do is just build your profile but be vigilant for anyone external that could be using your name okay um, and, you know, we're talking before a bit, a bit about sort of, you know, banks and the fact that they're less likely to reimburse um, than they certainly were probably a couple of years ago. Um, I know we're seeing an increase in, you know, effectively, um, whatever you want to call it, spoofing, you know, start, you know charity staff who are actually sending money to, to fraudsters thinking that they are real people. Do you want to give some examples or do you want to? You know, you know, I saw some fairly nasty stuff that have been done with AI in terms of faking. Do you want to talk a little bit about yeah, some of those issues? So, so linking on a little bit of what sort of Damon sort of touched on, you know, the we're seeing generative AI becoming far more authentic. So generative AI is realistically using your computer to make your know, mock-up, you know, either a voice or an actual video call. You know, we've seen instances where someone actually mocked up a Teams meeting, they'd had videos with the right people that should be in the meeting and asking finance directors to make payments. So it's becoming far more far more of a threat, especially when you know, the people involved will be the correct people. What we'd recommend is it's almost old school, let's get your, get your meetings in place to make sure you know, should that meeting be happening? And realistically, don't make the payment unless you've had some sort of authority to do it. And then it's just been my, it's having those controls in place. They seem to know when to send the right email. You know, there'll be the link that comes out that people will be busy and they'll click on it. So all you can do is just make sure you educate your staff and actually, yes, be mindful of this is the way the world is going. You know, test your system. So we've got, Damon's mentioned some sort of controls there. If you think this is the control you've got in place, let's make sure it works. Let's make sure that we can put as many safeguards in place to stop uh, that person. If you click on the wrong link, can we have some system that'll actually stop it getting any further? Can we stop people coming in by having some IT control or some internal process that if you get a request, if you've got to physically ring this person on the certain number that you that you know yeah. is correct, so that at least then you're having that dual authority there before actually just making the, the payment across. And you know, as that that has become far more sophisticated, but the the old fashioned one, which was basically the the dodgy email or letter changing bank details, that's still in existence as well. It, it's still there. Um, it, it's always going to be there. It's an easy way for people to sort of take money. You know, you'll have the contact of, yes, we've been hacked. Can you sort of transfer your details across to this? We've had a charity where 
again, it's the phone call. There was a, a fraud team from the bank that were contacting and wanting to say you've been a, a victim of fraud and you need to do X, Y, and Z to, to safeguard yourself. It wasn't the bank team. It was actually a, a fraud. They're doing it. So again, their controls, they thought they were in place, but actually it, it, it wasn't enough. So they, they became a victim that they're back to your statistic, trying to get the money back from the bank. Yeah. So No, that's, uh, that's great. That's a brilliant example of a non-technical controller, right? Because nobody should be allowed to just, if on the receipt of an email or a letter, change the bank details of an account for paying. It's got, it should go yeah. through a check. It's not totally not technical. Yeah. No, and, and I think, you know, it's, it's one of those simple things we'll talk a bit about later about internal mm -hmm. controls. If it's not, because, and, and it's amazing, actually, I think how often when you see an internal control manual, it'll mm -hmm. be in there that someone higher up the chain has mm -hmm. to sign it off. But if it's not actually happening practically, yeah. mm -hmm. if it doesn't happen when it happens, there's nobody yeah. having the control in the first place. Exactly. And what we find with those documents, they'll be written when the team writes them. You know, they'll be there from pre COVID. Exactly. And so the world is different. So it's yeah. make sure that you actually revisit them. Yeah. Damon, I'll come back to you, if that's right. Um, charities, as you, you've already mentioned about the fact that they hold different types of data, one of those types of data is personal information, donor lists, um, which often involves financial uh, information. Um, you know, have you got any specific advice around if people are using online fundraising platforms and things like that, how they manage that sort of data or not? Yeah, I mean, it's going to be the obvious answers, really. Um, so if they're obvious to you, not, not necessarily yeah, to us. And, uh, well, one, of, one of the yeah. consequences was the rise in lotteries, right, for charities yeah. uh, as part of COVID because they couldn't go out in the streets and raise money anymore for a while. You know, that was like so. So we saw a rise in lottery funds and, and lots of organizations just ran their own. And it's just you just have to make sure the environment's secure. So. What I and it's, it's going to be obvious things, right? If you've got an app, uh, a website that um, takes donations or you run a lottery or any of these things, you need to make sure they're not vulnerable in any way. You know, you've got to make sure that systems are secured. And the only way you can do that is by testing and then monitoring, right? It is the only way to make sure that those things, it's still not foolproof because still things happen, but you know, I will use that horrible word at the ICO and GDPR, right? They, what they'll want to see is every effort has been made, you know, all, all sensible effort has been made to protect, to understand the risk yeah. and then to put the protection in place. What they, you know, they really, what riles them and they really don't like is organisations that have done nothing. Yeah, yeah. And put nothing in place to protect them. So that's really, really important. And it, it, in fact, going back to it as well, um, talking about um, GoFundMe pages being created and websites being spun up and things like that. Well, we're seeing more and more of that, that we're, it's almost like brand protection that we do for organisations now where if someone was to bring up a, a, a Bevan, ampzanbuckland.com website we yeah. would identify that that's been spun up straight away obviously we would check with you guys is that relevant is that real you know is that you <laughs> you say no then we issue a takedown so we're trying to there is a move to sort of protect brands and then when things are mentioned you know like someone's gofundme page says i'm working with this charity and they mention the domain and they mention the website we hopefully pick up those types of links and we try to eliminate those types of yeah. problems as well but it is it, you're always going to have to be watching what's going on really so you need an organization that's able to sit there and just monitor everything and just make sure you're operating securely that's good. Um, sort of sticking on the sort of the side, but I mean, you know, Bevan and Buckton, like lots of other organisations, we now do hybrid working. So on any particular day, there's a lot of guys uh, and girls working at home, not just in the office. Mm. Um, I think most of our charities are in exactly the same boat. Yep. Are there any sort of specific things or extra risks that adds in you you have advice on how to protect? Or so we go back to 2020, then yes, because so many organizations realized they couldn't come into the office anymore. They panicked and they put some of the worst controls in ever. <laughs> they, they, they got, you know, really ropey products that, that would allow them to use their computers from their home computers. And, and it was just re done really, really poorly. We're seeing a lot less of that now. Really. And, and to be honest, you know, lots of organizations moved over to Microsoft 365 and other solutions like that, and they're fairly secure. So if we were having this conversation about four or five years ago, we'd be on about, well, you mustn't use you mustn't use your laptop in Starbucks or any other coffee shop, I suppose, and use public Wi-Fi. These days, it doesn't really matter. 99% of everything that you do is done over secure browsers. Remember the old padlock on your thing? Yeah. And that's pretty secure. If someone was to you know, try to intercept your traffic in somewhere like that, they're not really going to see anything anymore. 
So yeah, it is, it's just generally good control. So whether people are in the office or whether they're away from the office, whether they have to be educated on the risk, right? Users have to be taught about what a phishing email is. And you know, you guys, you go through phishing exercises and then you have the appropriate training and everything. That's really important. And that's all we need to do is just raise awareness of risk. And that will be different for all different types of organizations and also different for different types of charities, ranging from the smaller ones to the larger ones, you know. Um, I think so. someone's made a comment in uh, in the webinar here talking about and it, it. You know, it's, it's uh, you know, it's it's not a question. I think it's it's more of a comment, but it's uh, it mentions the different types of certifications that are available. Are you able to sort of in in, in thirty seconds or a minute explain yep. the difference between ISO two thousand and twenty seven thousand and one yep. and Cyber Essentials? Essentially, what right. are the different levels so and how do you work up? So in thing? the UK, so if we ignore American standards like NIST and things like that, right? The 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 bottom level is such a Cyber Essentials standard and the the, the top one is ISO 27001. Cyber Essentials is should every organization on the planet should go through that really, especially in the UK. Yeah. It's really low cost, starts at £300. Even if you treat it as a gap analysis, it's going to show you the right things, the right basic things that you should do as an organization. Great place to start. Um, unfortunately, though, with that, I mean, it is a self assessment questionnaire, and quite often it's not the the company themselves, the charity that completes it, it's normally their IT provider. And their IT provider can quite easily put down what they should put down rather than what's actually yeah. done. So there's a flaw in there. That flaw is sorted by um, Cyber Essentials Plus. Cyber Essentials Plus is where a company like ours will come along and actually test what you've said in Cyber Essentials Standard. So that's incredibly useful. Yeah. Okay. And you'll often see a company that has fails on Cyber Essentials Plus is because they've omitted stuff on Cyber Essentials Standard. Yeah. So that that's brilliant. But it, it, it comes back exactly to the point we make about internal controls. It's all whether yeah. we're having it written in a book somewhere. Yeah. If it doesn't happen day to day, what's the point? Exactly. Of so, so the plus gives you that extra reassurance. Actually, it's, it's not just what we say we're doing. It's what we're actually exactly. doing. Exactly. And that's brilliant. And then there's, so I suppose there's a really big gap to ISO 27001. And ISO 27001 is a completely different standard to Cyber Essentials. Cyber Essentials is a technical standard about technical controls about um does your antivirus work are your systems patched and everything and then iso 27001 is you know all about policies and procedures all really really important you know about disaster recovery business continuity and all those type of things there is something very quickly something no, in the middle <laughs> as well right so i asked me are the company that run the cyber central scheme on okay. behalf of the national cyber security center there is something that they are something else that they do, which I would urge all organizations to go through, is something called IASME Cyber Assured. It is a baby ISO 27001. And if I give you a rough idea, that to achieve um, is probably about two to three thousand pounds, all of it, right? Yeah. That pay, where 27001 is normally around 20, 25,000 okay. pounds. Right, so down. more affordable for this, probably and, the types of organizations that are is, on today. Yeah. Yes, and it's a cut down, but it it is that governance piece that does the what you have, where is it, and how do you use it? That's that. That's what that document, that, that, that process is. So incredibly useful. So they're the sort of main things that, that organizations go through. But then if you, you're a charity these days, though, that runs a venue and the venue has more than 100 people, then you're, you're restricted by Martin's Law now, which was a, a standard that was in, has just been recently introduced after the Manchester bombings, yeah. and that's got cybersecurity controls and everything else in it. So there are specific for different sort of sectors as well. But you and, have to keep an eye other things. Yeah. But the main one, Cyber Essential Standard, all the way to 27,001 with I Ask Me Cyber Assured in the middle. Brilliant. Um, Mike, um, we've probably got about five, 10 minutes left. So I just wanted to sort of go back to sort of the more general types of fraud. Um, you know, we talked about the types of fraud you see, you know, banking push, um, uh, but you know, you mentioned sort of internal fraud is very common. What are the things that charities can and should be doing to try and reduce the risk of internal fraud? We've we've touched upon it earlier, you know, and it, it comes back down to your internal controls, internal policies and procedures. You know, if you you I know charities, they'll range from very small where you've got a couple of volunteers up to your large charities where you've got teams of people and the controls across them all will be different. You know, there is no one size fits all. You've got to do what actually sort of fits for purpose. You know, it comes back to the trustees' responsibility. You know, the trustees are responsible for the charity. They've got trustee duties. They've got to make sure that their assets are safeguarded. So how do you make sure those are, you know, 
how are they safeguarded? Well, it's getting those controls in place. You know, what do those controls look like? They will look different for everyone, but they'll come back down to banking procedures. You know, what are our controls or who can spend uh, certain amounts? Are there authorization limits? Do you have to get sort of dual signatures if it goes over a certain level? You don't want to put too much red tape in, so suddenly everything has to be approved. You, you know, if you are delegating it to a team, you know, there'll be a, a limit that you can actually sort of delegate it down. But then the other side, you almost want it reported on. So it, it's almost full circle where we give you, you know, this level of control. However, we want to then see monthly management accounts. We want to see budgets and variances commented on. So from a trustee point, you are seeing regular, whether that's sort of monthly or quarterly reports. You can see where where the incomes come in. You can see where the spend is going. You can see, is the charity actually meeting its purpose? Are we Have we got concerns around going concern are we running out of funds do we need to look at who we're employing do we actually have to make those difficult conversations that we can't carry on under this model because you know we're going to run out of funds at a you know quite a quick uh, quick yeah. burn rate so it's it's report you know the controls are there to almost deter people you know it's never going to sort of stop anything but if you've got procedures you have to follow the people that might try and take some off chance if you've got to go through a number of people to get that spend signed off they're not going to chance it at that point so you are putting a deterrent in it ties in with your your cyber that almost sort of takes it from your, your external system point but at least then you're you put in a control you're organized and you actually know what you're doing what we would recommend this isn't a one-off document you know this is something that should be done annually new team members will come on board do they see what the procedures are are they issued with the document before they start have they read it do they understand it if you are a victim or you have a close call with a an instance of fraud let's go back let's reevaluate the controls how did it happen what can we put in place to make sure it, it doesn't happen again and just even if just evaluate it annually because the world is changing you know systems yeah. will change so if there's a new system, are the controls fit for purpose? So it's it's almost a live document that the board need to be pushing down. The board haven't got to implement it themselves, but they you know they need some in feedback on it and actually see what the controls are. But then for the board side, it comes back to sort of financials that they see so they can monitor. Yeah, and I think that's a good. But I mean, you both made the point today about how much the world has changed in the last few years. You know, if someone's got a set of financial controls that hasn't been looked at in the last sort of three or four years it's almost certainly out of date isn't it so you know it's probably something that every year a board should be looking at as one one of their board meetings it should be a, a sort of a high level review of financial controls when were they last updated are they still relevant is that fair to say yes and, and testing them you know it's almost that does that if it happened so we think these controls are in place well can we actually bypass the system to a point you know we know i was speaking with a charity earlier today and they're Potentially having issues with their bank, the bank won't actually let them have uh, some person issue invoices for authorization and somebody else pay them. So they're almost open to a potential attack at that point. So it's a case where well, speak to your speak to your banking provider. So like, these are the controls that we need in place. You know, can we get them? If they can't, potentially you have to look at changing funder for someone that can actually give you that level of control. Because once the vulnerabilities are there, as Damon probably sees far more than we ever will you know once the vulnerability they will have that link that'll be clicked on and then we'll have, the first time you find out is when you've actually lost the money yeah and then you end up with a charity potentially closing or they lose the charitable status because of it and the ramifications of it are far greater than the the small pain of when the controls in place no so the three thousand pound mm. for your you know i asked me check Compared to losing potentially hundreds of thousands of pounds, when you sort of compare it that way, it's worth the spend. It's, it's, really it's worth saying as well. Um, and so cyber is slightly different to a lot of what we talked about there with with the annual checks. You everything if you do annual checks with cybersecurity is a moment in time test. I we could test a client today and it could be completely secure. Microsoft could release a patch tomorrow that blows a big hole through that and makes it insecure. So that's why continuous testing, that's that's one of the fall downs for organizations that just do cyber essentials plus even, yeah. because it's testing that. If, if an organization, all they do is get their systems ready to pass that test every year, then the rest of the year, you know, the 11 months of the year, they could be vulnerable. It's so important, you know, that, that that's really important that they need. It is moment in time testing, and that's why you want to avoid with cybersecurity. You want to be on top of it all the time. So a constant process. It no, it makes a lot of sense. 
Um, I think we're pretty much uh, coming up to the, the end for time. So um, just in terms of final thoughts, I just wanted to um, hopefully skip on to one last little point. Um, one quick point on yeah. controls, Harry. The Charity Commission do have very good guidance as a starting point. So there's a internal control checklist for, for charities and so C C eight is the uh, the publication. So if you're a new charity, it's worth sort of starting off there. It's not gonna give you full controls, but it gives you a, a checklist of questions to ask as a starting point. And I think as you say, even if you know if it's even if you you're a charity with very old you know systems and you know, it's probably worth just checking it to make sure there's nothing updated. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just to finish, um, some of you will have seen this before. Hopefully, you can see it. It may be a bit small on, on the screens, but um, I'm going to talk through it anyway. Um, you, you know, it's a very common, well-known um, sort of something called the fraud triangle. And generally, where you see fraud take place, these three elements are all in existence. Uh, the one in the, in the in the bottom corner, their pressure motivation. That that is something that's generally out of most sort of charities' control. The individual that commits a fraud will normally have some sort of pressure. They'll be under financial pressure. It may be drug addiction. It may be a gambling addiction. There'll be something that's trying to force them uh, to need the money. And as I say, there's not a huge amount you as an organisation can do about it. Um, the second one at the top is opportunity. Um, that is one that is very much in any charity's control, um, and that's the one that you deal with through what we talked about today, having good controls. Um, around uh, internal financial controls and cyber controls to reduce the opportunities for a fraudster to be able to attack um, your charity. Um, but the one I just wanted to finish on is rationalisation, which is the one that is often forgotten about. And I'm really talking particularly today to, uh, to charity trustees, um, because very often when a fraudster is caught and, you know, sadly, we've, we've worked as a firm and we've helped the police and, and, and other charities um, who we brought us in to do investigations. When the fraudster is caught, they, they often try and rationalize what they've done. And it's often a case of, well, the charity wasn't whiter than white itself. They were up to no good in some way. So all we were doing was taking a share of what wasn't really theirs. So, and the reason I raise that is it is critical and the tone from the top, as you call it. So it's critical that the boardroom sets that tone of doing things properly, not cutting corners, not trying to, to do anything that is in any way um, you know, not ethically correct. And that comes down to things like if you're putting in grant claims and you don't spend all the money, you know, being honest with the funder and giving the money back is if you try and hide it and then hold on to the extra money, the risk is that someone in the organization sees that and thinks, oh, well, there we are. They're not being totally straight and honest. Um, I, I feel better in what I'm going to do. So just a final thought. I know many of you will have seen the fraud triangle before and heard what I've just said many times before if you're one of our clients. But if you're not, I think it's, it's something that's always worth bearing in mind, um, particularly at boardroom level. So thank you all to finish. Um, a massive thank you to, to Damon and to Michael for, for joining us. Thank you very much for all of you for your time uh, logging on this lunchtime to, uh, to listen to what we said. We hope it's been useful and enjoyable. We'll be sending out feedback forms. If you want to give us any comments or any suggestions uh, for how we can improve it, let us know. And certainly if you've got any things you want to tell us about for future webinars or, or topics you would like to see covered, please let us know and we'll do our best to cover them over the next few months. So thank you very much from all of us at Bevan and Buckland and at uh, Pure Cyber, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you.